Welcome to Navarra Life. I'm Michael Walker, and I'm back from my second bout of flu in a year. I've, I've, I've never had it before, and now within three months, I've been in bed two whole weeks. Uh, but we're back. Uh, we move. I'm very excited to be back. Dahlia, how are you doing? I'm good. I mean, you saying that just makes me want to pull out all of the like auntie remedies that I have for flu. So I'll, I'll, I'll send them to you when we're done. But yeah, I mean, I think it's just your body's just aging. What can I say, Michael? You're, just, you're getting weaker. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dahlia. You're such a, that's exactly what I wanted to hear right now. We have some big stories for you tonight. Um, pretty shocking story about children um, and the poor state in which we are housing them in this country. We've got the Daily Mail going after a student doctor for no apparent reason whatsoever. And then we're talking about Fox News. Really remarkable story. They have uh, settled for millions and millions and millions of dollars for lying and doing it on purpose or not somewhat, knowingly lying about a company. Inflation isn't going anywhere. At least if you live in Britain. Prices rose on average by 10.1% in the year to March. That figure is down from 10.4% last month, but it's higher than the Bank of England had predicted. And that's mainly down to record increases in the price of food. This chart from the BBC shows how the price of different foodstuffs have risen. Cheddar cheese up 50% since this time last year. Milk 40%, broccoli 32%, sugar 32%, eggs 28% chicken up 25% and sliced bread up 21%. We don't like to see that. And of course, wages are not up by anything that looks remotely like those figures. As well as prices rising at their fastest pace in 45 years, Britain is looking like a bit of an outlier. So we hear a lot um, about the chance for everyone saying this is an international phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon, nothing to do with this country in particular. Well, that's looking less tenable than it maybe once did. This chart shows consumer price inflation in different countries and regions. It increased everywhere in 2022, as you can see. But in the UK, it remains very, very high. It remains above 10%. However, in the Eurozone, it's down to 6.9%. In France, it's 5.7%. In the US, it's 5%. In Japan, it's 3.3%. Now, of course, that would normally sound like high levels of inflation, but compared to the UK, which is above 10%, you've got France hovering above 5%. You know, that's that's better for them than it is for us. So what's going on? Um, I will be asking um, an economist in a moment. First of all, let's go to someone who isn't an economist, but has a lot of control over the economy. It's Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. He attempted some positive spin. It's important to say, although our core inflation is marginally higher than other countries, Germany, for example, has higher food price inflation than we have. So this is a common problem that we're all facing. And when I talk to my colleagues at the International Monetary Fund, Everyone is very clear that the UK is on the right track uh, to focus on bringing down inflation. And if we do that, we can get through this very difficult period and make sure that we're not having the same discussion this time next year um, and that we can get back to growth, which is what we want to see. So that was him attempting a positive spin. It wasn't the most cheery of interventions. Um, was he right, though? Is the UK doing the right thing? When we compare ourselves to other countries, is it not really as bad as it might look? Well, I'm joined by James Meadway, economist and host of the Macro Dose podcast. Tell me, why is UK inflation staying higher than elsewhere? Well, it's look, it, it is high everywhere. There are some very big international uh, factors at work here, and we can come on to that. But Britain is doing worse than other similar countries, not necessarily than all European countries. If you come out to Eastern Europe, things are, are pretty bad in terms of inflation there. But compared to France or Germany or or a few other more obvious places to look at, it's not doing well. Um, some of that on food inflation in particular is Brexit. Uh, estimates from the LSE, from the Centre for Economic Performance at LSE, reckon Brexit's added about 3% to um, the price of food here. So that's certainly part of it. There's another bit where our energy costs, particularly for households, are substantially higher than in the rest of Europe. That's a privatised energy system. It's one that's not had much investment in it. It's one where government controls over the price of energy are weaker than they are in other countries in Europe. It's still, they've had to put in a lot of money into this, but it's still uh, not been enough. Uh, and we're a, a big importer of lots and lots of things we that are essential, like food and uh, energy in particular. We import about half the food we eat. So if the price of food internationally goes up, it has a big impact on Britain in a way that perhaps other countries aren't going to be so affected by. So you stack all of that up. And that's why things look worse here. Nothing the government is doing is going to make any real difference to any of that. 
um, sitting there and waiting for the Bank of England to put up interest rates isn't going to change the price of food that you're trying to buy from the rest of the world. These things don't work like that. Uh, demanding that nurses and doctors and everyone else has has some ridiculous uh, pay increase that means a real terms pay cut, that's not going to change the price of cheese. So nothing the government is doing is going to make very much difference to the inflation that we're seeing here. I actually think we should cut nurses' pay so there are less people competing with me when I go to the supermarket and buy cheese, because I'm, 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 I've been reading the economics textbooks, and I think this, this could bring down the price of cheese on toast for the rest of us if we price out the nurses. Different theories of, of, of inflation. So you talked about something, you've got Brexit, you've got these supply chain issues. Um, also, sometimes we have on the show Gary Stevenson. He suggests that it's because of you know, money printed over the course of COVID. And then often we hear it's sort of price gouging from, from corporations and companies. Um, where do you stand on this? Is it, is it mainly supply side issues, especially because we're talking about stuff such as food? Is it just that it costs more to grow food than it used to? This is basically the, the, the short version of it, but there's a complication on top. I mean, I, I love Gary, but I think on this, I disagree. I think he's wrong that you don't get fined that it's harder to grow tomatoes as it has been last year uh, in the Mediterranean because you've printed more money in Britain. Uh, you don't find, as you've seen, maybe the story today that 60% of Spain is suffering a drought and we get about a quarter of our fresh produce from Spain. Um, printing money electronically through quantitative easing in Britain by the Bank of England doesn't change what's happening with extreme weather in Spain or anywhere else in the world. So these are really big supply shocks often with an ecological cause, not always. Russia invading Ukraine is another big shock to the system. It's whacked up prices for grain and fertilizer in particular across the world. These are big global things that are happening, but then they feed into a whole load of very large companies who control particular parts of the supply chain where there are shortages and who have made astronomical profits last year because they've been able to hold prices up. Now, we all know about the fossil fuel companies. I mean, record profits for the likes of Shell and BP and all the rest of them. It's been less discussed, but the biggest agribusinesses on the planet, the giant companies who control the critical bit, the production of food elsewhere, right the way across the world, companies like Cargill uh, and a few other mostly American companies, They've seen their profits, the top four globally, up 225, 255% uh, in the last uh, 18 months or so. They're making enormous profits out of ecological crisis. So that's the kind of the whole story here. None of this, I don't think, is very much to do with money printing or whatever by governments. And it really hasn't got much to do with saying uh, wages are up too much. You know, we're paying nurses or doctors or anybody else too much at the minute. It's nothing to do with any of that. This is a much deeper, much worse crisis. And the blame in the first instance lies with those companies making profits from the environmental crisis. I was listening to your macro dose um, episode from today. Very interesting. And I mean, the, the impression I got from what you're saying is you think this is now permanent. You think that because we are entering into a climate crisis and because of the sort of degradation of, of, of nature, we're going to have more viruses and there's constantly always going to be these new crises that keep popping up. And every time we think, oh, it will be cheap in three months time, something else comes up. So, oh, there's a new drought in Spain. Oh, there's a new virus, which has locked down some production in, you know, this region of China, et cetera, et cetera. Is that what you're saying? Do we just have to get used to things constantly getting more and more expensive because there are more and more crises everywhere because of climate change, because of the degradation of nature, because of you know various other reasons one might put forward? This is the rather cruel part of it, is that, look, we're not going back to a world with a stable environment, right? We can do what we can to restrain more and more greenhouse gases being produced. We can do what we can to decarbonize as rapidly as possible. So you limit future damage but the damage is already happening and it's going to get worse. And just think about the last sort of 18 months, two years or so. It's every single, it's almost every day. There's some new story about extreme weather. There's extreme weather warnings across half of half of the USA at the minute. There's, there's droughts uh, uh, in Canada affecting crop production there. They, I've just mentioned Spain. We had that whole business a few months ago where what we were told was bad weather in the Mediterranean, in North Africa, is affecting uh, supermarket uh, shelves. You can't get you know, lettuce and a few other things to your salad because of this. And by the way, these shortages, what we see as a cost of living crisis, uh, and maybe sometimes you can't find something on a shelf, the UN World Food Programme is warning that 345 million people are on the verge of starvation this year. And, and that's when we haven't even got to whatever happens over the summer with extreme heat and the rest of it. So stack all of this up. It's all bad. 
what we have at the minute is a system that's designed for a world where the environment is basically very stable, particularly in heartland countries, the core of the system like Britain, North America, Europe. Uh, and it's designed to generate profits out of that and out of that stability. When things go chaotic, you find there's a few companies make super profits, but the cost of living for everybody else really crashes. Your wages don't go as far as they used to. So you need a really fundamental reshaping of the system here. You need redistribution. You need to see those profits squeezed in the first instance and wages and benefits and pensions go up so it at least matches the rate of inflation. There's a really good case of saying we're going to apply price controls like we do a bit with energy for households, but we can do that for rent. We can do that maybe for some essential foods as well. So we control the price and government says they'll cover the costs of that. But fundamentally, we need to restructure how we produce some essential things. Energy, it's ridiculous that we have a privatized energy system in Britain in a situation like this. It's ridiculous that we have to import on the world market when energy prices spike. People are seeing that OPEC Plus have just decided to restrict oil production to drive up the price of oil. Well, we need to get out of fossil fuels anyway, so we should invest in renewables and produce the energy we need here in Britain. But similar thing with food, that if we're importing nearly half the food we're trying to buy from the rest of the world, and the rest of the world is subject to all these shocks of various different sorts, that's going to be expensive for everyone. So we have to relocalize food production, rinse out the profits that are being made by all these different companies all the way down the supply chain, support small farmers, support more domestic production, and change how the whole system works in a really fundamental sense. What you're doing at the minute around fiddling about with interest rates and hoping for the best, about demanding nurses aren't paid enough, uh, which is Jeremy Hunt's big key to trying to deal with inflation, it isn't going to work. Probably Food price inflation has peaked for now in this country. It's probably going to look a bit better. The supply situation on food globally looks a bit better for the next few months. But you can't guarantee that for the end of the year, given the increasing pace and severity of extreme weather events right across the world, and given the fact you have these very large companies sitting on top of that and rinsing profits out of the system and out of the chaos. Inflation at the moment, 10.1% compared to 12 months ago. Now, I was always expecting that once you get to 12 months out from the Ukraine war, then it starts to just sort of mathematically fall, right? Because you're comparing yourselves to 12 months. If if the prices rose when the war started um, and you're constantly comparing yourself to 12 months prior, mm -hmm. then when 12 months prior was before the war, of course, inflation was always going to look very high. I thought once we got to a year out from the war, it would just sort of fall, not because prices are falling, but because we're now comparing it to a period after the war instead of before the war. We are a year on now. That hasn't happened. Yep. Um, when, when will it happen? Or am I even asking the wrong question now? Because you're saying it's not oh, just about the war, it's also about climate and all these other things. I, th I think that's the problem. I mean, look, you're, you're kind of right. The, the the inflation rates are coming down. I mean, it has come down a little bit, right? It's 10.4 to 10.1. It's down from 11 or so as it was before yeah, Christmas. So it's coming down a bit and it's coming down across the rest of the world, the developed world in particular, that's sliding. So the big push from the Ukraine war, this huge shock, particularly to energy systems, also somewhat to uh, grain and agricultural output. I mean, the two largest grain and crop exporters on the planet are Russia and Ukraine. So you disrupt them, disrupts the price everywhere, disrupts supply everywhere. Um, that's washing out a bit because we're 12 months down the line. The problem is, is exactly what you hit on, which is that, okay, that big shock, really big shock, and COVID and supply shock from the lockdowns, that's kind of washing out. But now we've just got more and more of these other shocks that just keep happening. It just keeps being the case that you suddenly find, oh, there's going to be some difficulty uh, in supply. And by the way, that isn't necessarily just food. I mean, some really peculiar impacts of climate change, things you wouldn't necessarily have thought about, uh, that, that nuclear power plants in France couldn't run at full capacity last summer because the river water they used to cool those nuclear power plants was too hot to cool them properly. So they had to produce less electricity. That means the price of electricity goes up. That contributes to the energy crisis right the way across Europe because France is a big exporter of electricity. Um, you couldn't transport goods down the Rhine as well as you might want to because the Rhine had dried up because of the heat. You uh, semiconductor plant in Taiwan you know, this place that produces 90% of the, the world's most advanced microprocessors had to close down because of drought, reduce production because of drought, because you need loads of water to produce semiconductor chips. So, so this effect is happening all over the place, and it keeps happening. And either we build an economy that's resilient, that will actually protect people, most people, from these effects, that works out a fair way to deal with these big shocks and risks and gives people a decent standard of living, even though this is happening, or we build, and in fact have got, a system which takes this chaos and actually generates profits out of the shortages that appear, because that's what we're doing at the minute. 
So either we're going to change how that system operates, or we're going to be stuck with inflation kind of permanently higher than we might have got used to over the, let's say, you know, two decades or so up until 2008, maybe up until COVID. You know, that's not the world we're in anymore. We're now in a world of crisis and kind of permanent crisis of climate, of nature, of shortages. And you have to change the system to cope with that. Well, you got me feeling worried, James. We can't uh, just cross our arms and wait for prices to fall because another crisis might come up. But it's good to be alert to them. Um, and to be fair to you, you have been saying this for a while. I remember towards the end of COVID, you were sort of saying, like, this is going to change the world. I was like, come on, it will, it, will, it will end. You're being too pessimistic. But the the pessimists are um, are doing well at the moment when it comes to predictions. So uh, thank you for your time <laughs> and your cheery no input this evening, James. <laughs> New research by the National Housing Federation has revealed that more than 300,000 children in England are being forced to share a bed with a parent or another child due to overcrowding in their homes. It also reports that nearly 2 million children live in overcrowded housing. That's every one in six child in England. Alistair Smith is head of policy at the National Housing Federation. On Sky News, he explained the effects of overcrowding on children. The impact of overcrowding on households is, is quite profound, and there are a number of them. So the people that took part in this research, they said that their mental and physical health had been negatively affected by this. For children in particular, around half of those living in overcrowded homes said um, that they felt embarrassed or ashamed even to bring friends back to their house. Uh, mm. So that has an impact on their relationships. Also that they didn't have enough space to do their homework. So it affects their educational outcomes. And you can imagine that for a large family without enough space, that pressure of just living in a confined space means worse family dynamics. So simply more arguments uh, or perhaps parents who are unable to get along as well as they might because they don't have the space to do so. The cause of the problem is pretty obvious. We don't have enough good quality social housing. Smith went on to explain how we got here. What we saw during that period in the pandemic is this issue manifesting itself even mm. more because of more people just simply having to spend time in their own homes. But actually this issue is, is long standing, yeah. and it's caused by uh, around four decades of underinvestment in social housing. The biggest cause of overcrowding in homes is a lack of supply of social homes. Uh, so we've seen that by successive governments over four decades. And in particular, uh, just over a decade ago, the government made a decision to cut uh, capital funding for new social housing yeah. by 63%. And that means that last year, uh, we only built around 6,500 homes for social rent. That's the most affordable tenure, the home that would be most suitable for people uh, in overcrowded homes on lower incomes. And that's a drop of 80%. Um, but research that we, we co-commissioned at the National Housing Federation a few years ago shows that, in fact, to meet housing need in full, we should be building 90,000 homes for social rent every year for a decade. So we're a huge, huge way away from that. A huge way away from where we need to be. Um, the Times had a breakdown of the figures here. They reported this. Parents in 180,000 families regularly sleep in a living room, bathroom, hallway or kitchen, the study suggests. Half a million children, including 142,000 teenagers, share a bedroom with their parents. Up to 900,000 children struggle to do their homework. Women are disproportionately affected. About 300,000 single mothers' families live in overcrowded homes. Even though they make up less than 25% of all families, single mothers account for 40% of overcrowded families. Ethnic minority households, of which 10% are overcrowded, are three times more likely to be affected than white households. In 2010, around 35,000 new homes for social rent were built. Last year, that figure had dropped to just over 6,500. That's a reduction of 81%. But the dip is even more depressing if you go back a few decades. So in the 1970s, we were building over 100,000 new social rent homes a year. What happened in the meantime? Did we suddenly forget how to build houses? No neoliberalism and Margaret Thatcher and all that happened in the meantime. And what is the government going to do about this crisis? Well, you guessed it. They're going to pass the buck. A department for levelling up spokesperson said this. It's unacceptable for anyone to be living in an overcrowded home and councils have a duty to find people living in these conditions somewhere fit for purpose. Now, that is the stupidest quote I have read on tonight's show. I've spoken to people that work in, in councils that work you know, high up when it comes to finding homes for people who are in housing need, they don't have the homes, right? And they don't have the homes because they don't have the money to build enough. So to, to have a Tory government, right, the party which privatized social housing, which banned councils, councils, sorry, from reinvesting any of that money in new housing, and which starved 
local councils over the past 13 years to now turn around and say like, oh no, but it's your job. It's your job to house people. It's your job to house people. If you're not giving them any money to build social homes, then they, they literally can't house people, right? There aren't loads of councils. I mean, you know, there are lots of bad councils, but I don't think there are lots of people in, especially labor councils around the country, let's be real here, who were saying, oh, I just can't be bothered to house these people. I think maybe they can make do in this tiny house. No, it's that you've got decent, reasonable people working in the housing office and councils across the country who are saying, we literally don't have any houses to put these people in. Um, and, and then you've got the Department of Leveling Up saying, oh, it's their fault, it's their fault. It's the government that has the money. Central government can borrow way easier than councils can. Um, Dahlia, this is an incredibly frustrating, depressing story. I mean, I think housing in this country, one of the biggest, most obvious examples of policy failure after policy failure after policy failure we're seeing now. Um, it's kids and teenagers who are suffering. The story that in England, you know, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, one in six children are living in overcrowded housing. To me, it really undermines so much that we're told about capitalist development, right? This idea that living standards are always going to get better, that, you know, the economy is going to grow and we're all going to take a share of it. And even if things aren't perfect, they're better than they were, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago. They're steadily improving. But the image of children sleeping in hallways, you know, and entire families living in one room is honestly reminiscent of, you know, the the um, late 19th century, early 20th century. It's Dickensian almost um, in in its imagery. And the idea that, you know, someone like Rishi Sunak, who has, what, five multi-million pound houses? uh, And then there are are people in this country that are, you know, sharing beds with siblings. it's it, it's an it's a really an indictment of of the, the of our housing system and our economic system um, more broadly. And obviously, as we've seen in in the clips that you've shown, the knock on effects of this seemingly simple fact really can't be overstated. You know, you have the physical and mental health impacts of children not being able to have enough space to play, of not having enough space to do their homework. You have this strain on family relationships. There's also, as we saw in the pandemic, a a health risk to overcrowding. You know, um, working class families, families uh, of color were at higher risk of of catching COVID and not being able to isolate from one another if they lived in overcrowding, in overcrowded housing. So there's many interlocking factors that emerge as a result of this um, of this problem. And for me, you know, as someone who taught in the middle of the pandemic, I could really see how students that that couldn't didn't have an environment that was conducive to their education at home really impacted um, really impacted their outcomes. And so for me, this is just it, it's one of those examples of the kind of markers of inequality and the kind of the the things that set in even in your very early years that have knock on effects throughout your life. And yet we rarely talk about it. It's rarely identified as a marker of inequality or as a driver of inequality. And yet it is set in stone um, so early on. So yeah, to me, this is really um, an indictment of our economic system as well as Um, of our housing situation, because it shows that unless you specifically design policy in order to do so, you can't guarantee that things are always just going to get better than they were historically, because the images that are being described here are literally Dickensian. Yeah, I mean, you really don't want to be sharing a bedroom as a teenager. It's not not a good vibe. We're a very rich country. We've been sleepwalking into this situation for decades because central government hasn't done anything, right? If central government had said, 20 years ago, this is New Labour were terrible at this, by the way. You know, I've, on recent shows, I've sort of been defending New Labour a bit when it comes to things such as the NHS. Yes, they've got the waiting list down. People were very satisfied with it. But housing, I don't think there is any defence of, of, of New Labour. They just completely drop the ball. Whether you're sort of centre-right, whether you're soft-left, whether you're far-left, I don't think anyone looks at New Labour and says, oh, that was, a, that was a government that did well when it came to housing. They didn't build any social housing, right? And so we're in this situation now, and obviously the Tories didn't either. Now we're in this situation whereby you've got teenagers sharing rooms with their siblings or their parents, and a government says, oh, it's the local council's job to house them. Yes, it is the local council's job to house them, but they don't have the houses to do it. And your job is to step in and make sure they do. Just when you think Britain's right-wing press couldn't sink any lower. 
they stun you with a shocker. The Daily Mail has published an article that seems to have just a single purpose, to bully a medical student out of public life. Why would they do that? Now, it has all the classic male ingredients, misogyny, anti-strike sentiment, and a pretty loose understanding of the facts. Here's the headline, Daily Mail classic style. I love their long headlines. Um, Obviously not the content. Sorry, I couldn't join you on the picket line. I was too busy getting lipo. Glam, rabble-rousing medical student 26, who thinks junior doctors should get more than a 35% pay rise, missed four-day strike to undergo cosmetic surgery. Now, there's an awful lot going on in that headline, so we'll break it down for you. Um, The article was written by the Mail's health editor, Stephen Matthews, and health reporter, Emily Stern. Despite working on health stories, neither seemed to have any qualms about splashing private medical information across a national newspaper. Now, at the centre of the story, or I mean, it is a non-story, isn't it, is a medical student, Ailey Garrett, who had the gall to support the doctor's strike. She had it coming. The Mail reports this. Miss Garrett joined tens of thousands of young medics on the picket line during the last walkout in March, which led to 175,000 procedures and appointments being cancelled. But Mail Online can reveal Miss Garrett, who has racked up millions of views on her pro-strike Twitter post. How dare she? Was unable to join colleagues during the four-day strike last week. This was despite it being branded the worst strike in the NHS's 75-year history, designed to bring the ailing health service to a standstill to get ministers to agree to the BMA's demand. Now, it's worth pointing out that Garrett is not a junior doctor. She's a medical student. Um, According to the BMA, medical students can't participate in the junior doctor's industrial action, right? They can show support by visiting a picket line. Um, They're not allowed to join it, but they can visit the picket line. Now, this seems strange because the Daily Mail are are, are very annoyed that this person didn't visit a picket line. Now, the Daily Mail would normally hate it for you to visit a picket line, but this this particular girl, no, she should have visited the picket line, especially if so many operations are going to get cancelled, you better goddamn visit the picket line. She's not even on strike. She's a medical student. Anyway, let's, let's, let's go on because the male um, employed all their most advanced investigative techniques here. Um, and we want to know how they were able to reveal her absence from the strike. Well, of course, classic Daily Mail, Daily Mail style. You can do all your investigations at your laptop at the moment. They scoured her Twitter feed. Um, the article went on to say this. Miss Garrett, who has yet to qualify as a junior doctor, told her 7,000 followers on Saturday, she's basically a celebrity, after the unprecedented strike had finished, that she had undergone lipo to her upper and lower abdomen and inner and outer thighs and flanks earlier in the week. She wrote, recovery isn't supposed to be going this badly, but clearly I'm a wuss. It wasn't traditional lipo, so usually a much faster turnaround. Before anyone says I didn't do it to lose weight, she added, I was happy with my weight, but I carried a fair bit of weight on my thighs and my hips, that I felt was disproportionate. So this was just the right decision for me. So I suppose she, she wasn't doing this to lose weight, but to change her shape, I suppose. Anyway, it's none of my business. This is not why we're telling you this story. Um, 7,000 followers. This is now, according to the Daily Mail, a person of public interest. If you support a strike one day, you better go to the picket line the next. And if you dare to have an operation, we're going to write about it. Um, that's the message from the Daily Mail. Of course... Um, the hit job um, on this person um, does seem to be motivated by the fact that she's campaigning for a better deal for medical students. As I say, how dare she? Campaign for anything good in this world. You better goddamn be perfect or we're coming for you. Let's go back to the article. They go on to say this. The Newcastle University student last year co-founded the campaign Livable NHS Birth. Oh, that sounds sinister. Which calls for a review of the financial aid medical students receive during their training so they can blow it all on liposuction, I bet. Currently, medical students are provided with full funding for their first four years of study as Student Finance England funds students for up to four years. After this, the NHS bursary provides eligible full-time undergraduates. So we don't provide them with enough money, essentially. And the campaign calls on the government to allow medical students um, to access their maintenance loans for the full course of their degree. Now, if you've got a big crisis when it comes to staffing in the NHS, introducing some kind of bursary system for students Seems pretty sensible to me. Um, But if you are an editor of the Daily Mail, then the moment someone campaigns for that, you are sending out your top investigative journalist. Find something on this girl. Now, I don't care how old she is. I don't care if this is her private medical records. This girl had the temerity to tell her 7,000 Instagram followers that nurses and doctors deserve good pay. 
Um, and, and then she had the cheek to go and get liposuction. Unbelievable. Um, despite the male's best efforts, Garrett is refusing to let them shame her. Writing on Twitter, she said this. I chose to get surgery and I'm not going to feel ashamed about it. I don't think anyone here doubts how much I support the strikes despite my absence from the picket line. I was also absent from the picket line one of the days during the last strikes because I was busy seeing mates. This girl's sick. This girl comes across amazingly here. I think she'll make a great doctor. I hope to get treated. I don't hope I don't get treated by her. One. I hope I never get sick again. I'm sick of being sick. Um, but if I were to get sick, I would love this girl to treat me. Is that what you do? I suppose that's what you do. Dahlia. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this is an entertaining foray through uh, the Daily Mail, sort of journalism 101 with the Daily Mail there for you. This is how you attack and destroy someone with 7,000 Twitter followers who supports decent pay for decent people. It's funny how frequently, like, when the Mail tries to do a hit job on someone, they accidentally make them into an icon. Like, I just found myself, when I was reading this article, just like the Lucille Bluth <laughs> meme, just being like, good for her. Like, <laughs> love it. Like, and also, there's worse things you can be called than a glam, rabble-rousing medical student. So, yeah, you know, sick. but... But obviously, I mean, obviously, like what this is, essentially, there, there is obviously nothing wrong. There is no no hypocrisy. There's nothing contradictory about wanting better conditions for junior doctors and getting liposuction. Like that's not a crime. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But what is actually behind this story is it's essentially the classic techniques that the right wing media deploy in order to discipline the public into keeping quiet or while pretending that this reporting is about public interest. Because essentially what they do is if you dare to stick your head above the parapet in any way, even in the most minor way, you know, this this woman essentially is just just supports the juniors, junior doctors. On, on social media and, you know, set up a campaign. It's a very minor form of sticking your head above the parapet. But even that minor infraction, you know, if you, if you challenge vested interests in the most meager way, then you can expect to be punished, essentially, by a right-wing media that is going to trawl through your history, hold you to standards that are ridiculous, that no one can meet. And if they can't find anything incriminating about you, uh, they will just either make it up or just misrepresent the facts. And that's what we're seeing here. It's essentially, it's almost like the modern version of dissidents being flogged in the t in the town square. It's a way of sending a message, not only to this woman, but to anyone else that might be watching and thinking about sticking their head above the parapet, about being dissident in any way and saying, we will come down on you and we will discipline you through trying to publicly humiliate you. Because of course, it, it's not in the public interest that you know, some random woman who supports junior junior doctor strikes uh, is has gone to have liposuction. It's not in the public interest. What is in the public interest is why the government uh, is refusing to approach negotiations in good faith uh, to restore doctors' pay, even though it would cost a fraction of, for example, what they shelled out to their private contractor mates to make PPE that was unusable by NHS workers. That's actually what's in public interest, but that's not um, conducive to the agenda of the right-wing press, which is to discipline the public's imagination, to discipline the public's response to the political realities in which they live, and to keep them within a very narrow set of rules. And they do that by punishing people who in any way, cut, you know, fall out of line. Uh, and so that's what this is really about. It's not a good faith assessment. I'm sure the people who wrote this knew that they were writing something completely ridiculous. But it's essentially a way of trying to intimidate both this young woman and anyone else who might be thinking about publicly supporting something that isn't quite aligned with the vested interests in this country. You're only allowed to support anything anything if you never leave the rock you're under other than to visit picket lines, apparently. So it's almost quite like, um, quite radical, isn't it? From the, da the Daily Mail want you to be a real, like, vanguard, cater. If you're, if you're going to get into politics, you better not do anything other than politics in your whole life. Um, seems to be the suggestion. Rupert Murdoch has spent more than five decades spewing out toxic misinformation. And finally, 
the lies of his media outlets have come back to bite him. That's because Fox News have agreed to pay Dominion, a company which makes voting machines, $787 million. It's a lot of money. It's one of the biggest defamation settlements in history. And it's in response to Dominion's claim that Fox knowingly spread lies about their voting machines in the weeks after the 2020 elections. Now, let's look at some of those lies. I think many Americans uh, have given no thought to electoral fraud that would be uh, perpetrated through electronic voting. That is, these machines, these electronic voting companies, uh, including Dominion, uh, prominently Dominion, at least in the suspicions of uh, a, a lot of Americans. Tonight, every American should be angry. You should be outraged. You should be worried. You should be concerned at what has happened in the election. The Dominion software system has been tagged as one allegedly capable of flipping votes. How, for example, did senile hermit Joe Biden get 15 million more votes than his former boss, rock star crowd surfer Barack Obama? I just love the way they say on Fox News, like, you should be concerned. You should be terrified. You should be, it's very transparent what they're trying to do. They're trying to rile you up. In any case, just so you know, those were Fox News hosts, Lou Dobbs, Sean Hannity, Janine Perro, and Tucker Carlson. It was all pretty wacky stuff, of course, firing up the Republican base who believed the 2020 election had been stolen. And as well as democratic implications, the wild nonsense also had reputational implications for the company they were talking about. Now, that's why Dominion sued Fox News. And this is where it got interesting. Because to win a defamation case in the US, you don't just have to have lied about a person or a company, you have to have done it knowingly, right? So Dominion, to successfully sue Fox, they have to say, not only did they lie about our machines and it sort of damaged us commercially, but they lied about our machines, it damaged us commercially, and they knowingly did it. They didn't genuinely believe that these machines had screwed up counting of, of votes, which you know they, they didn't. Luckily for Dominion, to prove this case, they had access to the receipts as part of the court case, internal emails and text messages were released, and they included hosts contradicting what they'd said and done on air. This is very awkward, very awkward. If you're going to say something on air, don't send a message the day before saying, I definitely don't think this is true, especially if it's not commercially damaging for a company that's going to get to read these, these messages. Before further ado, let's go to one example of these messages. Um, this one is between Tucker Carlson and producer Alex Pfeiffer on November the 8th, 2020. Carlson, the software shit is absurd. <laughs> and then Pfeiffer says, I don't think there is evidence of voter fraud that swung the election. Now, this, this sounds sensible. This sounds very sensible, more sensible than they normally sound. The very next day, though, Tucker Carlson said this on his show. We could go on tonight about what happened in last week's election, and in future shows, you know that we will. But for now, let's sum it up. Here's the point. We don't know how many votes were stolen on Tuesday night. We don't know anything about the software that many say was rigged. We don't know. We ought to find out. But here's what we do know. On a larger level, at the highest levels, actually, our system isn't what we thought it was. It's not as fair as it should be. Not even close. Sorry, hate to say that. It's the milk bottles at the fair. They knew you were coming. They laughed at you when you left. We wish that wasn't true, but it is true. And you are not crazy for knowing it. You're right. I hate to say this. I really didn't want to say this. I hate to sow doubts in people's minds, but there are real serious questions to answer about the software here. You know, I'm just being real. I'm just talking the truth. I'm being real with you here. Literally the day before, the software shit is absurd. The same guy, same guy, day before, the software shit is absurd in, oh sorry, two days before, in privately, software shit is absurd, two days later, you should be terrified and worried and angry because questions need to be answered about the software. Fox also platformed conspiracy theorists um, without challenging their claims, why would they? Sidney Powell is a lawyer who was involved in several lawsuits challenging the 2020 election result. Fox repeatedly booked her onto shows where she alleged wide-scale voter fraud involving the machines of Dominion and other companies. But on the 22nd of November 2020, another text exchange took place between Carlson and Pfeiffer. This time, it involved another host, Laura Ingram and Raj Shah, a senior vice president at Fox Corporation, the parent company of Fox News. So let's look at this conversation here. So Shah to Pfeiffer, so many people openly denying the obvious that Powell is clearly full of it. Pfeiffer to Shah, she is a expletive nutcase. 
and then Carlson to in Graham. Um, Pal is a nut. As you said at the outset, it's totally wrecked my weekend. Wow. I had to try to make the White House disavow her before they obviously should have done long before. And then Ingram to Carlson says, no serious lawyer could believe what they were saying. And Carlson to Ingram, but they said nothing in public. Pretty disgusting. God, can you imagine knowing that a, a ridiculous idea is being spread and saying nothing in public about it? Can you imagine that? Unbelievable. I, I'm struggling to think of an example. In any case, they clearly think this person is pretty batshit. Yeah, just a week later, Powell appeared on Lou Dobbs' show on Fox Business. I think most Americans right now cannot believe what we're witnessing in this election. We have across almost every state, uh, whether it's Dominion, uh, EBS, whatever the company, voting machine company is, no one knows their ownership, has no idea what's going on in those servers, has no understanding of the software because it's proprietary. Uh, it is the most ludicrous, irresponsible, and rancid uh, system uh, imaginable in the world's only superpower. <laughs> Again, it's it's, it's, it's real totem. This, I don't want it. The world's only superpower. We should be able to have software that works in our voting machines. I mean, they did have software. That, I mean, there are lots of problems in America, but their voting machines isn't one of them. Choose one of the real problems. Of course, always close to the center of the drama was former President Donald Trump. Um, communications from top executives show that they discouraged hosts from challenging Trump's claims of fraud in the wake of the election. Suzanne Scott is Fox News CEO after Eric after host Eric Sean fact checked Trump's voter fraud statements on air. She wrote this email to another executive. This has to stop now. This is bad business, and there clearly is a lack of understanding what is happening in these shows. The audience is furious, and we are just feeding them material bad for business. So someone thought, you know what, actually, maybe we should fact check some of this bullshit, and they apparently get told off. Or, you know, this is strongly discouraged. The evidence all looks pretty damaging for Fox News, which is presumably why they decided to settle this case with Dominion before it went to trial. And this is Dominion's lawyer speaking after that settlement was agreed. The truth matters. Lies have consequences. Over two years ago, a torrent of lies swept Dominion and election officials across America into an alternative universe of conspiracy theories causing grievous harm to Dominion and the country. Today's settlement of $787,500,000 represents vindication and accountability. Lies have consequences. The truth does not know red or blue. People across the political spectrum can and should disagree on issues, even of the most profound importance. But for our democracy to endure for another 250 years, and hopefully much longer, we must share a commitment to facts. Misinformation will not go away. It may only get worse. Make that man president. You feeling inspired, Dahlia? I mean, on a more serious level, does this show there is a real cost, a real cost for knowingly lying on air? Well, it's difficult, right? Because the US has a really different approach to things like regulating media uh, because of its First Amendment the First Amendment, it doesn't really have a proactive regulation process like we do here, you know, Ofcom, which is supposed to be there to be able to proactively regulate, uh, you know, misinformation, misleading, um, you know, harm, etc. Whereas America kind of have this situation whereby there is no regulate, not much of a regulatory system, but instead there's this kind of reactive system whereby um, if you kind of violate very particular capitalist laws of defamation where you know there's a you can prove a loss of profit or whatever uh then the pun there's a punishment system rather than you know a reactive punishment system rather than a proactive regulatory system so in many ways it's very difficult to describe this as genuine accountability because 
on the one hand, whilst it is probably the closest we've ever come to holding an institution like Fox accountable for the way that they misrepresent the truth, et cetera, you know, it's the largest sum that has ever been paid in a settlement like this. At the end of the day, there's no preventative system being put in place to stop something like this from continuing to happen. Uh, there's no, I don't think the there's going to be a public apology, or at least the terms of the settlement don't seem to indicate that they will have to do an on-air apology. There's no clarity of any if anyone's going to be fired who is responsible for spreading this misinformation. And in many ways, the damage is already done because, you know, even though the number of Americans that believe that the election was stolen is reduced is reducing, you still have 63 percent of Republican voters who still believe that Biden didn't legitimately win the election. So in a sense, the horse has already left the car in a sense or the stable. I'm not sure what the what the what the saying is. Um, but I also always find these kind of settlements um, a little bit bittersweet because on the one hand, even though it's not obviously a an official admission of guilt or wrongdoing, it's often interpreted as such. And that is certainly a win. But on the other hand, I feel cheated often by these kind of settlements because the reason that a company like Fox would choose to pay this massive settlement is because they know that if they had to go through the legal process, if Rupert Murdoch had to take the stand, if, you know, there was a subpoena on all of this information, that a lot of stuff would come out um, that would put Fox in a really bad light. And in a sense, I would have loved to have seen, you know, a process of forcing Fox to be transparent about how it actually works and how it often knowingly, uh, in this case, spreads misinformation. Um, but it's also important to remember that punishing Fox with fines in this way doesn't really hit it where it hurts, because in many ways, Fox is probably willing to factor a lot of this kind of you know, this financial loss into its operational costs, because ultimately the goal of something like Fox is not to make staggering profits. It's actually to create the conditions through that disciplining of public opinion, through the disciplining of public imagination, to ensure that the conditions for capitalism continue to prevail. And so when that's what's at stake, Money is, you know, there's no amount of fines that could ever, it would always be a drop in the ocean to the actual broader landscape of profit that is being secured by the ideological frameworks that Fox is is normalizing. Um, and so it, it's really, it's really difficult to say. On the one hand, it's the closest we've ever come to accountability. But on the other hand, it's not really true accountability because no one's really going to pay the ac a price that actually matters. Um, the power of Fox is not going to be reduced and no systems to prevent this from continuing to happen um, is actually going to be put in place. Reform UK is a right wing populist party currently trying to take on the Tories at the next general election. Formerly the Brexit party, they've campaigned against lockdowns, net zero pledges and of course, immigration. This week, they held their spring rally where Alexandra Phillips gave this speech. I am white and I don't feel ashamed. <laughs> I am a woman and I don't have balls down there, but I have balls, I tell you that. <laughs> I'm straight. And I passionately believe in the sanctity of marriage as happy households make a healthy society. Yeah. I am a curious Christian and I rally against efforts to change 2,000 years of community and shared morality to fit in with, with some kind of neoliberal dogma. You know, this determination to dissolve the glue that has held us together for centuries and destroy a culture that has enabled us to thrive and to prosper in harmony is now so pervasive that most of our politicians dare not speak against it. Yeah. Yeah. Big corporations aren't challenging it. No, they're trying to profit from it. And we, 
we, the ordinary people, are being increasingly encouraged to just dumbly accept it when we really don't want to. Did we not see in the recent SNP leadership election so clearly attacks on a Christian candidate who stood up for her beliefs? Yeah. Only, yeah. only to be beaten by a man of Muslim faith never once held accountable for his. That last thing, I mean, there's a bunch of things you can say about that, but that last thing is just a complete outright lie. Kate Forbes was asked what she thought about abortion and gay marriage and she gave one answer and Hamza Youssef was asked what he thought about those things and he gave a different answer his answer was more socially liberal so he didn't get attacked the same way that Kate Forbes did anyway maybe I'm taking her more seriously than I should do but I just thought that needed to be quickly debunked um it was very amdram I thought the whole speech but Reform UK are not doing too badly in the polls so according to YouGov their latest poll Reform have six percent now that might not sound much but the Greens are on five percent so you already do you know a, a party which haven't been around for too long is out polling the greens at least in that one poll dahlia how worried should we be about this party or should we just be entertained by how batshit they seem in the speeches they've been giving this week i mean once i saw that clip of her screaming i'm white and i don't feel ashamed i was like that's about to get flogged on social media <laughs> like that, that's gonna be memed the hell out of that which i also participated in i was like this is me when I'm digging into my cream tea at my favorite National Trust cafe. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we should be worried <laughs> because this is incredibly, I actually appeared on Politics Live with this, well, I didn't really know who she was at the time. Now I realize she's a pound shop Marine Le Pen. Um, essentially, it's very interesting how, you know, when she was sitting next to me on Politics Live, you know, she was, you know, talking about sort of being treated as a, as a sort of common sense person, you know, talking about, um, you know, the we were talking about the um, the fact that Britain has essentially abandoned the refugee convention. And she was saying, you know, oh, of course, you know, we would never abandon the refugee convention. That's not what this is about. This is about just, you know, sorting out our asylum processes. And in the studio, you know, that she came, you know, she was treated as a sort of reasonable interlocutor um in the but in the you know political landscape but then when you see her in her own crowd she's essentially it feels you know a lot of what she's saying to me feels like it's kind of gesturing towards some of the anxieties of this great replacement theory um that is becoming popularized amongst the far right which is essentially this bizarre idea that you know white people are under some sort of coordinated threat, that there is this coordinated attempt to, you know, reduce the number of white people, to, to make them feel ashamed, to make them feel whatever, to, to, to undermine essentially the superiority of whiteness. Um, that's the kind of like the, the image that these people have. And they use this in order to kind of spread conspiracy theories in order to make people in order to sort of stoke up tensions within communities and it's funny how you know when the kind of the 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 growth of, of like of something like that within our politics is kind of increasingly being normalized as just a normal part of political conversation without any regard for the history of harm that that kind of thinking has has embedded, and you're completely right um, that you know it's it's grounded in a complete fantasy. The 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 comparison between Kate Forbes and Hamza Yusuf is so deeply racist because Kate Forbes has openly talked about how her faith shapes the way she's going to be governed. So understandably, journalists were asking her, well, what does that mean for the policies that you're promoting, Hamza Yusuf? is a Muslim, but he has always said that the way that he governs is not shaped by his faith. He's never evoked his faith in the context of, you know, how he's go how he plans to govern Scotland if he was elected first minister. So really, the fact that journalists still continue to co ask him constantly, despite the fact he always gave a clear answer about whether or not his faith um, would mean that he would take roll back on the civil liberties of the queer community that was motivated from a bigotry a bigoted position that essentially thinks that muslims aren't capable of participating in you know the democratic norms of western society right 
And so that's why there was something different between the way that Kate Forbes was talked about, because she put her faith out there as a governing principle of her politics, whereas Hamza Youssef was, and that's why she was asked about it, Hamza Youssef was only asked about it because he's a brown Muslim and there's paranoia um, about, you know, brown Muslims being in public life. And so in a, in a sense, the actual reality of what happened was an exact inversion of what Alex Phillips was portraying there. But that's the whole point. It's to feed this paranoia um, that will have, when pursued to its logical end, incredibly destructive and harmful consequences, particularly for people of colour in this country. Let's wrap up there uh, before I have another coughing fit. Dahlia, it's been an absolute pleasure being joined by you. Thanks for having me, Michael. I hope you feel better soon. I'm sure I will. I'm on the mend. Um, Thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. Um, You can click a link in the YouTube description box below to head to our podcast feed, leave a review and hit follow. Come back to this channel tomorrow for another live stream at 6pm for now. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.